And now, friends, let us join together in the call to worship as it is printed in our bulletin. The bold print is for your response. Come, sisters, brothers, siblings, gather together. Plunge your sorrow and worry into the fountain of life. Give your questions and doubts to the heart of God. Amen. Let us raise our voices and sing together the hymn 251, Christ is Alive. Now let us come before God in prayer. Our prayers of invocation and confession, let us bow down. Let us pray. Lord God, early in the morning, when the world was young, you made life in all its beauty and terror. 
You gave birth to all that we know. Hallowed be thy name. Early in the morning, when the world least expected it, a newborn child crying in a cradle announced that you had come among us, that you were one of us. Hallowed be your name. Early in the morning, surrounded by respectable liars, religious leaders, anxious statesmen, and silent friends, you accepted the penalty for doing good, for being God. You shouldered and suffered the cross. Hallowed be your name. Early in the morning, a voice in a guarded graveyard and footsteps in the dew proved that you had risen that you came back to those and for those who had forgotten, denied, and destroyed you. Hallowed be your name. Early in the morning, in the multicolored company of your church on earth and in heaven, we celebrate your creation, your life, your death and resurrection, your interest in us. So to you we pray. Lord, bring new life where we are worn and tired, new love where we have turned hard-hearted, forgiveness where we feel hurt and where we have wounded, and the joy and freedom of your Holy Spirit where we are prisoners of ourselves. Amen. Friends, to all and each, where regret is real, God pronounces pardon and grants us the right to begin again. May the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Welcome, welcome to worship here at Central on this second Sunday in the Easter season. As always, we invite you to share refreshments and time together in the hall, which is just uh, down the hall to my right. Um, and also, we welcome all those who join us each week via live stream. Um, this morning, immediately following the benediction, uh, our interim uh, moderator, the Reverend Dr. Philip Wilson, will offer an update on the search process. And so that will be uh, right at the end. There are two announcements that I want to highlight for you. The first is next Sunday. Next Sunday, friends, April the 14th, 10.30 a.m., our special guest preacher will be the Reverend um, George Zimmerman. Um, George was baptized, raised, and ordained as Minister of Word and Sacrament here at Central Presbyterian Church. At the age of 70, he was called to serve at Mully Children's Family in Kenya. Um, since its inception, MCF, so Mully Children's Family, has been opening its doors uh, each successive year to provide hope to street children, orphans, child mothers, abandoned, abused, HIV, and AIDS affected and infected desperate and neglected children, regardless of their religion, sex, color, or tribe, who have nowhere to call home and no one to care for them. MCF provides them with food, shelter, clothing, education, medical care, spiritual guidance, mentorship, and most importantly, parental love. Uh, George has been transformed by his experience there. For him, it was a resurrection experience. And he wants to share it with us. You will want to be here. You will be blessed. Uh, there will be lunch following with uh, a brief presentation by George. So that's all happening next Sunday. And the second date I want to bring to your attention is Saturday, April the 20th. This is at 7.30 in the evening. The Knitting Pilgrim, featuring the stitched glass tapestries of Kirk Dunn. Uh, he will uh, stitch and speak, uh, especially to the three Abrahamic faiths. 
Uh, this is uh, uh, an, an amazing presentation, I'm told. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, please do come. There's a, a voluntary um, free will offering of $10. Uh, but this, this is something to, to behold. It's happening here at Central. It's uh, Saturday, April the 20th at 7.30 p.m. And now once again, let us raise our voices and sing together the hymn 389, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Now I invite my young friends to please come and join me here in the front for some time together. Welcome, welcome here front and center. Oh, so good to see you all. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, just keep coming. Wow. So today I want um, to share with you this beautiful story of two friends. And the two friends are Jesus and Peter. Jesus and Peter. You know how they first met? They first met by the seashore. So Peter was a fisherman, and so he's fishing, and Jesus is passing by, and Jesus loves this guy, and he says, Peter, I love what you're doing, but now I want you to come follow me, and I want you to fish for people. And Peter drops everything. He drops everything, and he starts following Jesus, and, you know, over the next couple of years, they become really close. They become friends. So, uh, Peter and Jesus have this special friendship that's happening. And then, one day, Jesus is in trouble. Jesus is in trouble. People come at night, and they arrest him. So, they bind him, they arrest him, and they take him away. And you know, Peter wanted to stay close to Jesus, but he was scared. So he followed secretly. And they take Jesus to what was really the courthouse. It's the high priest's uh, palace. 
and they take Jesus in there and they start asking him questions and they're rough with Jesus and Peter kind of goes into the courtyard and there was a fire and Peter starts warming himself by the fire and somebody says hey I know you you were with him the guy that's inside being questioned and Peter says no I don't even know him so Peter denied that he knew Jesus and then somebody else says hey you're with him you're one of them and Peter says no I'm not I don't even know him so a second time Peter denied that he even knew Jesus and then a third time this young woman comes and she says you were with him you're one of them and Peter says I swear I swear I don't know him and Peter swore he didn't know Jesus and Jesus turned and looked at Peter and Peter was so sad he ran away and he said So they took Jesus and as we know Jesus was crucified and, and, and died but that wasn't the end Jesus came back and once more Jesus and Peter met and again Peter was fishing with his friends and one of his friends said hey I think that's Jesus on the shore and as soon as Peter heard that he jumped up on the boat, he dived into the water, and he swam to the shore. And Jesus was there. And he had a fire going again, and Peter warmed himself, and, Pe and Jesus already had some fish um, cooking on the fire. And Jesus said, Peter, I want us to talk, so let's go for a walk. And Jesus and Peter started walking on the shore. And Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus asked again, Peter, do you love me? And, and, and Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. And as they walked some more, Jesus asked them a third time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter was sad that Jesus asked him for the third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I and Jesus said, feed my sheep. And so that broken relationship, that broken friendship between Peter and Jesus was made up again. And you know what? From that day on, Peter never, ever denied that Jesus was his friend. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for friendships because they're very special. And we ask you to help us to be good friends, good friends to others. And even if a friendship is broken, help us to remember that Jesus is with us and can mend broken friendships. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for this time together. Also, we will be continuing to read at chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. Jesus and Mary. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she, spent, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying. 
one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Continuing to read at verse 24, Jesus and Thomas. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. <clears throat> A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Continuing to read at chapter 21, verse 1 to 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know, did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul in it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the lake. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went abroad and hauled the net ashore 
full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jesus and Peter. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go to wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Thanks be to God. So friends, this morning let us um, reflect upon and enjoy these final two chapters of John's Gospel. They offer us a full taste of Jesus' very personal encounter with three of his followers, Mary, Thomas, and Peter. To know the risen Jesus not only as a figure in history or as a subject of faith, but as the very one who encounters you and I personally is to know him in these meetings which yet remain mysterious and deeply challenging. So first we recall from the last Sunday the encounter with Mary Magdalene. The first day of the week, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, she came to the tomb. Very sad, shaken, in fact, having come through the Friday of the crucifixion, the burial before sundown, the anguish and sleepless Sabbath, she arrives on the Sunday morning while it is still dark to the place where the master's body was laid to continue the grief work, to confront the body, to process the loss, the usual prescriptions for good and proper mourning, but mourning is already breaking. She's the first to see the risen Lord, though she mistakes him for the gardener. Quite right, too, because for John, this is the beginning of new creation, with the light breaking through into the darkness of the early morning garden. Quoting New Testament scholar Tom Wright, Jesus and Mary are not exactly the new Adam and Eve, but the resonances of the first garden and of the healing of its ancient wound are powerfully present. And as Mary looks through her tears and sees first the angels and then Jesus himself, we recognize not just a new reality, but a new way of knowing that reality, a new creation, which is to be known by the mourners, those who weep for their loss, for the world's 
loss. And Jesus' answer to her stumbling question is more powerful than our translations can acknowledge. Up to now, in, the, in most texts, Mary has been referred to by her Greek name, Maria. But now, Jesus calls her by her Aramaic name, Mariam, her original name, the name her parents called her, his mother's name. And in that fresh naming, there's also a commission. Mary, Miriam, is to be the apostle to the apostles, the first to announce to everyone else that he is risen. In this story, we observe Mary's transformation from desolation to animation, from confusion to action. Within a moment, a lifetime of journeys over oceans, abysses, deserts, mountains, condenses and collapses into one life-defining revelation. Second, the encounter with Thomas. Thomas is quite different from Mary. Again, quoting Tom Wright, no tears, just stubborn resistance. He demands evidence. He wants to see, to touch. Thomas stands for so many who still ask, but is it true? Thomas has insisted upon personal contact and even a physical intimacy, placing his finger and hand into Jesus' wounds. He doesn't want to live in the imagined fantasy world of someone else's story, reality or nothing for him. And fair enough. Since God is the creator of all the stuff that we can see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and our hope is for the renewal of creation, not from an escape from creation into an imagined world. And Jesus meets Thomas, fair and square. He doesn't say, no, Thomas, you're coming at it the wrong way. We don't do science here. Yes, there is a gentle but firm rebuke. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. But this only comes after Jesus has offered Thomas his hands and his side. Evidence you want, evidence you shall have. Thomas is invited to probe in order to believe. Put your finger here and see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. We're not told, however, that Thomas takes him up on the offer. Instead, Thomas takes a flying leap past anything the others have yet said. My Lord and my God. If we go back, to the beginning of John's Gospel, that great prologue, that great hymn to the Incarnation, we read, No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made Him known. And now at the end of the Gospel, in Thomas's confession, we finally have a match. It took the whole gospel to do it. Jesus' life of healing and teaching, his entire passion, the resurrection and the post-resurrection appearances for this confession to match the beginning of John's gospel. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. That's the prologue. My Lord and my God. The end of John's gospel. Sometimes, sometimes it is the doubters who, when convinced, become the most insightful. 
my Lord and my God. It is the climax of the gospel, and it might not have happened this way had Thomas not had his doubts. But his confession is one of the strongest in the New Testament. The disciples with Thomas, of all people as their spokesperson, have confessed that the flesh and blood person they had known and now know again in a new way is also in truth the Word was one with the Father. So John brings it all together and he does it through Thomas. The brilliant Jewish philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein said, it is love that believes the resurrection. I love that. I love that because it comes from a razor-sharp mind, one who taught logic and analysis. Once you have done all the hard intellectual work, and you need to do it, you need to come to that edge. Once you have done all the hard intellectual work, it is love that takes over to bring you to the final knowing, the intimate knowing. It is love that believes the resurrection. In our gospel passage, it is the manifestation of love which wins Thomas over as he exclaims, my Lord and my God. That comes from his heart. Jesus does not appear wearing a halo. There isn't a blaze of glorious light surrounding him. There's no angelic chorus of hallelujahs. It's the mark of the nails in his hands and the scar in his pierced side which open all of their eyes to see him. Let's take that in. The writer of John's Gospel is telling us that the risen Christ is known by his wounds and scars. He is the same one who reached out to touch and to heal the sick and wounded, the same one who was beaten and crucified. In his rising to new life, Christ's wounds do not disappear. They remain as marks of his obedience and marks of his power, his authority to redeem. Now, we come to the last chapter of John's Gospel. Peter and six other disciples go fishing and catch nothing. Jesus, unrecognized, gives instructions from the shore, as once before in Luke's Gospel, resulting again in a spectacular catch. Coming ashore, they find Jesus already cooking breakfast and inviting them to share it. And just before we get to Peter, let me draw your attention uh, to the portrait of the risen Jesus which is given to us here. As in other gospel stories, the Jesus of this one is real, palpable, a physical person capable of performing physical acts, including cooking breakfast. But I trust you also picked up on an oddness a difference about him, which can hardly be put into words, but only hinted at. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. The word for ask in the original Greek is exetazo, which means examine. It is more than asking. They knew it was him, says John, but at the same time they wanted to press him with their questions. Now why would they want to do that? Wasn't it obvious? Wasn't it obvious that it was indeed Jesus who had told them to drop their nets on the right side and was now cooking breakfast and asking him to join and asking them to join him? Well, yes. It was Jesus, they knew that, but they were, also, they were also aware of Jesus being somehow different. They wanted to ask, 
Lord, we know it is you, but what happened to you? None of them dared press him. The brief account is, is just heavy with the strangeness of new creation. It reflects a primal moment of simultaneous recognition and puzzlement. An awareness of something they could hardly put into words except as a question, a question they dared not ask. Finally, we come to Peter. Again, I quote Tom Wright's exposition here. The breakfast on the shore in that early morning is happening around a charcoal fire, right? This is meant, of course, to remind us, the readers, of the terrible moment in the hall of the high priest by another charcoal fire when Peter three times denied even knowing Jesus. The smell of that fire must have brought it all back to Peter. Jesus knows that Peter is suffering. Peter needs to come clean and to be forgiven before he is commissioned for the work that is ahead of him. So, Jesus takes him out for a walk along the shore. We know this because we found out later that the beloved disciple is following them. And as they walk, Jesus asks him three times if he loves him. Simon, son of John, do you love me? It is a question we all face, says Wright, particularly those of us called to ministry and leadership within the church. If we know our own hearts and woe betide a church that is led by people who do not, if we know our own hearts, we know that we have all let Jesus down. That our hearts and minds have plenty of memories of our own charcoal fires. Of the times when by our actions or words we have in effect denied we even knew Jesus. If Jesus comes and comes again and asks the same question, do you love me? The Greek text makes it quite clear that Peter's response uses a different word. He can't bring himself to say the word love, agapao, the word for that utter self-giving love that Jesus himself has shown on the cross. Peter can't use that word. He uses the word philo, the word for friendship. Yes, Lord, he says, you know I'm your friend. Jesus asks, do you love me? And Peter answers, you know that I'm your friend. That's as far as he can go. Anything else would seem to be back in the realm of blustering, of boasting. Lord, I will do anything for you. I will lay down my life for you. That's what he said during their last supper in the upper room. Now on the walk along the shore, He's going to start farther back. But then the miracle. Well then, replies Jesus, feed my lambs. We expect perhaps a note of rebuke. Peter, why did you let me down? We might have hope for a word of forgiveness. Peter, you let me down, but I forgive you. What we do not expect is a fresh word of commission. Feed my lambs. Here is the miracle of the resurrection as it applies directly to our joyful living in the world. The blessing to live life in its fullest, to live freely and joyfully comes in the form of forgiveness. Forgiveness never simply brings us back to a neutral position. And the command to live into the future can never be on the basis that we are good people, well qualified, fully prepared for what we must do. That was Peter's problem earlier. 
Now he begins in the proper way with penitence, forgiveness, and fresh commission. This is the gift of the risen Jesus to Peter and please God to us as well. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus asked the same question a second time and gets the same answer. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I'm your friend. Look after my sheep. But then on the third occasion, Jesus changes the question. Now Jesus asks Simon, son of John, are you my friend? And John telling the story indicates that Peter was upset that on this third occasion, Jesus used these words. Perhaps he thought Jesus didn't believe him, and that he was challenging even the lesser claim that he had made. I don't read it like that, says biblical scholar Tom Wright. I think Jesus is saying, in effect, very well, Peter. If that's where you're at, that's where we'll start. If you can say you're my friend, we'll build on that. Now, feed my sheep. And then, of course, he goes on to warn Peter of what is to come. This sheep feeding business will cost him no less than everything, as it cost the master shepherd himself. Let's appreciate that none of these people, Mary, Thomas, or Peter, are cardboard cutouts producing stock of questions and answers. And the resurrected Christ is not above wiping away our tears, answering our hard questions, and inviting us to come with the humility and the love to be now his hands and feet in the world. Just as for the very real people dealing with their limitations and aspirations, so for you and for me, the resurrection confronts us with a new creation and new possibilities which open before us. The resurrection is not the end, but the beginning. The resurrection ignited the Christian movement. It changed fundamentally and forever a scared and scattered bunch of followers who had abandoned Jesus after the Last Supper and tried to go back to their old life and they likely would have, but in encountering the risen Christ, the risen Jesus, Mary and Thomas and Peter, and later all those who knew him in his life came to know him after his death. And this experience transformed them from followers to apostles, meaning literally those who are sent to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. There would be arrests and shipwrecks and outpourings of the Spirit and persecutions and stoning and miles of weary travel. But Jesus would go with them. And that changed everything. Amen. Friends, as we meditate, on this word of God to us, let us sing together hymn number 250, I Danced in the Morning.
Friends, in this season of Easter, we celebrate God's precious gift to us in Christ dying and rising as we present our gifts to God. May our generosity reflect God's goodness to us and hope we have found in Christ Jesus. Our offering will now be received.
And now, let us come together for our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession and joining together for the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. God of all new things, God of spring and fragrant flowers and unexpected snow, God of hope and new life, bless us, we pray this day. Creator God, from whom all life springs forth, we give you thanks. Come, one and all, celebrate and rejoice. Celebrate and rejoice. The old has passed away, everything has become new. God of all things passing away, God of old and yesterday, the one who is with us in our despair and fear. God who sighs and weeps with us, God who wipes away our tears, loving God, we offer up our prayers and concern this day for those struggling to rebuild lives from natural disasters, especially those recovering from the recent earthquake in Taiwan, for the lives lost and those who mourn them in Gaza, for those held hostage, abused and frightened, for those in the midst of war. And we pray for our own who are struggling with illness. Bring wholeness, we pray, bring comfort as we intercede on their behalf, Lord. Hear us when we pray. Incline your ear to our words, silent, shouting, cries, mournful, whispers, stunned, wordless. Be gentle with our suffering, with our sorrows and losses, and especially when our hard hearts close us off to you. Be gentle. Be gentle, O God. Be God. Anoint us with your touch so that the softness of your love can break into our hardness and open us anew. Anoint us, Holy One. Fill us with your loving touch. Fill us that we can touch in your love and fill others. Fill us gently. Fill us. Living God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Mother, daughter, family, friend, one all with, through, and by your love becomes reconciled. Celebrate and rejoice. The old has passed away in you, in your creation, in your life and love. Everything becomes new. For we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Together once again, let us lift our voices and sing the hymn, 410, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You.
And now, friends, may the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, the Holy Spirit keep you, that you may live in faith, abound in hope, and grow in love, both now and forevermore. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Please just relax for a few moments. For those who, who don't know me, my name is Philip Wilson. I am the interim moderator who has been tasked with the uh, search process for finding your new minister. And I've just uh, uh, finished a, a stint of pulpit supply, and so I'm going to be back with you for a while. Uh, but it's now time for me to give you just a quick update as to what has happened in the last little bit and what is going to be happening shortly. Over the past while, we've had the uh, congregational self-analysis surveys which have been distributed. Uh, we've had a lot of response uh, from them, and I thank you very much for those who did uh, fill in the uh, surveys and get them back to us. Uh, we really appreciate it. and. That information is not going to sit on a shelf and never be seen again. It's already being put to use. We have the search committee that has been uh, determined uh, by the session and uh, all have agreed to participate. Uh, the names were listed in the bulletin last week. We've got 13 people who are uh, on the search committee and they represent the various uh, diverse areas of the congregation. We've had one meeting so far, and I'll just let you know who they are, just so that you know, just in case. Marilyn Craven, Hubert De Bruin, Sue Dunlop, who is also our chairperson, Crystal Forcier, Sharon Lee, Beth McKay Riley, Adele Pierre, Emma Riley McKay, Jeremy Sander, Mark Stupel, Lise Marie Swanepoel, Sarah Tropicante, and Chidinma Umezi. And so those are the individuals that are comprised of the search committee. And even though we've only met once uh, so far, uh, to go over the basic tasks and to divide up information. Um, because the, the reason that we collect all that, uh, the, the congregational self-analysis uh, uh, information was so that we can create what's called a congregational profile. Now that is the document which we send to head office and then we send to prospective uh, candidates. Once, once we've got to the point of being able to have that document and send it in, then head office will look at it and match it up with possible uh, candidates, and they will get that information back to us. Uh, it'll also be posted on the denominations website, and so then we'll, we'll have to start waiting until we get uh, candidates contacting us but we can also contact uh, prospective candidates at, a lot at the same time. We're meeting again tomorrow to continue the work of putting this uh, profile together. And what I would ask you is that we covet your prayers. This process that we're engaged in, we're engaging in it together. And it's extremely, extremely important because we need to find that special person through prayer, through the leading of the Holy Spirit. That special person who will lead you into the, into the future. You've been very fortunate for the last couple of years. God has brought you an, an exceptional minister in Nick 
who has helped you through the last few years. God led that path. God is going to continue leading the path as we seek your new minister. So it's an important task that we're engaged in here. The search committee, there is an excellent bunch of people and we covet your prayers as we continue this process. One of the next steps that you'll actually see is on the 28th of this month because during the worship service we'll be having a service of commissioning where we highlight the importance of the search committee and we also commission them to service. So please be here for the, the 28th for that part of the service. Also, if you have any questions along the way, uh, last week there was an, a, a piece in the bulletin where it, it had my contact information. I noticed that for whatever reason it's not in there this week. If anybody needs, you know, has any questions or concerns, they can contact me directly. Uh, I'll make sure that that information is back in the bulletin for next week. Uh, just in case, though, it's, uh, my email is revpmw at outlook.com. My phone number is 905-574-4383. So if you do have any concerns, uh, you're, feel free to contact me uh, because nothing is being hidden. Everything is going to be out in the open. And I will continue to keep you apprised as things continue and, uh, and develop. But uh, thank you once again, and once again, please keep the search committee in prayer. Now, I guess go in peace. <laughs>